Any of my tank tests have been harder to fight for 10 years since I've used it. And it's a harder fight for everyone. So, yeah, that's, before this pressure ends, yeah, every three years getting it certified. So I need to take it. I'm Robert Jordan. I just saw the uh, uh, this particular meetup come through on the Colorado blockchain and uh, interested in, in space, so thought I'd come in time. Super, thank you. Who else is new? Anyone? Okay, well, we'll go over to right here. So we're going to have uh, Evan come up and talk about QZETA for just uh, four or five minutes. Uh, just, and then we're going to switch right over to, uh, to our feature presentation. Okay, super. Hey, well, again, uh, I've presented before, and so thanks for your help last time. Uh, and Jim, thanks for a quick uh, moment here to make a shout out. Um, my ask is I'm looking to build our team. And so I asked you for a quick moment to uh, you know, reintroduce Cusetta and uh, say, hey, we are trying now to add a technical co-founder, the person to join the team. So if you remember Cusetta, uh, the idea here is that brands may tag any image on the internet in which they see their product. Consumers may hover or click the tag and reveal the content. And then the content will render on every instance of the image on the internet worldwide. In this particular case, this is the Spanish version of BuzzFeed. And this image here is being rendered on about 180 URLs worldwide. That's a reach the brands just don't have. And so that's what we're developing. Uh, the team is in good shape, and we're building it. And you can see on the left, we've got two open spots. All right, and this case here, looking to add a technical lead, a technical co-founder, a real partner to join us in this one. Uh, marketing and sales, uh, I've been doing a lot of that. Uh, that's an important role, uh, especially with some of the brands, like the cosmetics brands, etc. cetera. Um, but the real important one at the moment is the technical co-lead. And so, you know, simply put, this is what I'm looking for, uh, entrepreneurial skills and attitude, technical on the left, attitude up here on the right. Uh, okay. And in that sense, I'm really looking for this person that embraces the whole idea of customer discovery, solutions, working with vendors, etc. You know, it's that true entrepreneurial spirit. And on the left, you know, my coding was all AI pre-internet with factories and robots, etc. Um, I don't have a chance trying to keep up today with JavaScript and Python, et cetera, et cetera. But really need somebody to join us over here on the left. Full stack, new product development, that's everything from discovery to IP. Right? We've got plenty of IP to manage here. Mobile apps, browsers, extensions, et cetera, a lot of energy. And then also under commercial management, meaning, hey, Let's work with development shops. You know, let's figure out roadmaps and milestones and pricing and all that sort of stuff. And then over here, it's the sort of the softer side of that. So with that in mind, if any of you have a network or are interested, please let me know. Here's my contact stuff. I'm here through Thursday and all that sort of stuff. Um, fair part. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thursday. So, uh, one million cups, uh, we thank you everyone for, for the coffee and galvanized for this awesome space. And uh, Ian and Juliasha and I are the co founders. Uh, we are generally looking, oh, Ian, you got the dome going. Ah, we don't need it. That is the dark brain. We often uh, build these things and for years. We'll film, and then we'll talk about the distribution of that when you're comfortable with that. Okay, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> There's nothing in there that is confidential, so. Good. Yeah, but Scandi may need to invest the right country last time. Oh, okay. Um, let me just get set yeah. here just for a second. So, Ian, you have the, the video going on. Huh? 
The video's going, that's awesome. The video's happening. The video has happened and continues to happen. <laughs> Uh, next week, yeah. yes, we have uh, Vanessa, some uh, Thomas nuclear. nuclear in Space, which is a nuclear reactor concept that she's been working on and has, you know, a respectable set of advisors on. Uh, I'm not sure what she's going to do with this nuclear reactor, but we generally hope they don't. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we're put it down somewhere. Yeah, right. here because it's only so that's why I was asking. I hear yeah. Iran's in the market for something. <laughs> she needs money, by the way. So, do you need to go to the house? I was out here or something. Great. Super. Yeah, I'm kind of a sharp, sharp person. I can tell, yeah. Uh, Somebody. Okay. She's the aerospace person. Yeah. Somebody okay. mentioned uh, uh, Bolt to Shutter Beat, so next week, lots of panels, lots of fun stuff. Um, uh, I'm going to be convertible debt with a bunch of VCs. So there's lawyers versus VCs. And that's on Monday. <laughs> and then on Friday, uh, I'm honoring a panel of a bunch of uh, enterprise sellers and buyers for what's different about selling enterprise versus consumers or SME. So if you think you are going to a bunch of enterprise sales company, come to that. That'll be fun. Two shameless plugs. I'm uh, sure there are other panels as well. The third, uh, I'll be uh, introducing Christos Papadopoulos, who runs the MDM testbed at CSU, and this offers us a more secure uh, networking protocol, an alternative to the universal IP protocol. When you say you're introducing the test, yes. start? Older start with you. Yeah, Wednesday morning. Wednesday morning? Yeah. Okay. Only this one we'll see. So yeah, I'll do a shameless plug too. I'm, I'm Susan Strong from Sage Boulder Pro Bono Mentoring for really early stage companies, and there's some mentors here in the audience. Uh, we have uh, Friday morning, we have a session at Made Life, and we'll be pitch coaching a uh, cohort of people from Canada, from an incubator in Canada, that are coming down. There's uh, eight companies, and three of them are going to pitch live, and we're going to give them feedback. So that should be fun. Super. I'm really drunk. Any other announcements before we get going? All right, so we have two questions before we start with, with all our presenters. First is, what's the design of this presentation? The second thing is, what is your answer? So, how do you kind of use this presentation? Yeah, so I'm looking for feedback. Um, this is a, a concept pitch, and it's different from what you're used to because it's not selling a product and it's not asking for a company, it's actually selling uh, intellectual property. So that's the difference there. Um, so the ask is, you know, if you have uh, either if you guys are interested or if you know people who are interested in companies that are interested in would be interested in this patent, um, that's, that's what I'm, I'm really looking for, leads for that and feedback. And naturally, you'll get feedback on your effectiveness of your data. Yes, yes. I've been here enough times to get to see the card. We are not easily constrained. Fair enough. All right. Okay, so good morning. Thanks for coming today. I know it's a little early each day to, to start out. I'm Dirk Norton from Creator Dog Technologies. So I'm going to share with you a potentially disruptive um, concept today. Uh, that addresses many of today's identity-related um, issues. So, I think, uh, All right, so let's begin with a question. Um, if you think about it, each day we attempt to prove our identity fairly often. Um, we enter a pin or a, a fingerprint or a password into our phone or our laptop to log us in to unlock it. Um, we also, if we want to go to our, our bank's website, usually it's two-factor authentication, password, and they text you a one-time code. And when you go shopping, uh, you go to a merchant, you often just give them your credit card. All of these things are ways that we, today, prove we are who we say we are to, to various um, things. Well, it doesn't mean to be this tedious um, or problematic. What if it were as easy as, well, doing nothing, actually? That's what I'm going to try to do. All right, so why am I here today? As I mentioned, Creator Dog Technologies is interested in um, 
finding people or companies that um, are interested in purchasing or uh, leasing, uh, sorry, licensing our patent. Um, the potential uh, target audiences, sorry, <coughs> the Potential target audiences would be financial institutions, Visa, MasterCard, uh, companies that are losing money, a significant amount of money through fraud, uh, device manufacturers, Apple, Samsung, um, that make uh, cell phones, uh, laptops, uh, wearable devices, or wearables, and companies like ADT or FrontPoint that, um, that makes security systems for your home, your car, your office, uh, those types of things. So to reiterate, we're not selling a product, and we're not um, seeking funding to develop a product. We're here to sell intellectual property. All right. All right. So as individuals, we all participate in the financial world. Um, we experience some fairly serious identity-related problems. Um, passwords are required everywhere these days. They're easily guessed. They're forgotten. Um, often it's stolen. Um, identi identity theft is running rampant at this point. 45% um, of all Americans uh, had their identity stolen last year, and many don't even know it. And, and this leads to some serious financial fraud. Uh, last year, the, uh, in the U.S., financial fraud cost um, companies over $200 billion. This last year, $200 billion. $200 billion, that's a lot of money. That's a big financial incentive to address these problems. So what if it were, if there was a convenient, fraud-proof way that we could identify ourselves anywhere at any time? All right, so one of the popular solutions that the, industry, the banking industry has adopted um, uses public key cryptography um, to to try and address this problem. So each transaction from your phone is digitally notarized, digitally signed, but think of it as a notarization, digitally notarized, and then by you, by a key on your phone, by you, and sent to the bank, and the bank can verify that notary seal that's on the, the transaction document using the certificate that, that they manage in the cloud. The nice thing about this is once that Transactions notarized. If anybody tries to change it later on, that that notary seal is no longer valid. It's detectable. It's changed. So, um, so the bank essentially assigns a, a notary key to you. They maintain a digital certificate in the cloud that they can use to verify you. So that's the solution. However, there are some issues with that. First of all. That key has to reside on your phone. You need this phone. And your phone can get stolen. If it is stolen, then your notary key is stolen, and with that, your identity. Also, one that you don't think about as often, but rogue applications can be installed on, on mobile phones. And they can, they can watch for when that key is being used and steal, even without you knowing. So those are the vulnerabilities that we're all trying to work around. All right, so we can address the, the, these vulnerabilities by you know, introducing a separate smart wearable device. So pendants, you know, bracelets, rings, um, that work in a secure way with your mobile phone. That wearable device has to be um, convenient enough that you keep it on, so it's with you at all times. Um, but it also has to be a pure hardware solution that's hardened. Um, no apps can be installed on it if you don't want that mobile app. And then those devices can communicate with your phone using Bluetooth, so uh, many devices you use today. Okay, so the combination of those two, that smart device and your mobile phone, um, pr provides a much better solution. All notarization happens inside the smart device, okay? It doesn't happen in your phone. And uh, both devices are required to be in very close proximity to do any notarization, to notarize any documents. Um, and your notary key is not actually stored either place. How is that possible? Well, that's actually why we have this. <laughs> so that's the, that's the, the magic there. Yeah. So the bottom line is that this hacker has to get a hold of both of these devices. 
at the same time to use your identity. So let's compare that with um, three of the commonly seen <coughs> security approaches. We're all familiar with user ID passwords. They're, um, they're everywhere, but they're generally not very secure. But they're very risky. Secure fogs is one you carry around when you use to get yourself into a door. Um, those are very secure, but um, they tend to just work with specific devices, and the fog is actually fairly easy to steal. Um, secure mobile apps, those are pretty good. They're convenient, they're secure, but again, if you lose it or it gets stolen, um, your, your uh, key gets stolen like that. So really, the only one that that meets all five of these criteria here is that wearable identity concept that we're proposing. Alright, so once we have a, a convenient fraud proof um, way to identify ourselves electronically, there's actually quite a few applications that you can use it for. Um, one that would be probably most useful for all of us is automatically logging us into our phone or our laptop or even to websites just by opening the phone. Okay, uh, we'll do that one. That's pretty powerful. Um, also, automatically locking and unlocking doors as we go through them. It can be your, uh, your house, your office, even your car doors. Um, and if you think about it, once you know who you are, you know who others are electronically, we can get rid of spam over email and, and messaging. That's um, and it also provides a safe and convenient mechanism <coughs> for merchant payments. Where you just go up and tap your phone and the payment goes through and nobody can steal it and you can't. It, you, you really are being saved on it. So that's Alright, and then fraud proof banking. Um, all of the transactions you do with your bank, they know it's really you doing this. Um, a lot of people are into the cryptocurrencies these days. Uh, the, the vulnerability there is your crypto wallet has your private key in it. And so if somebody steals your wallet, your electronic wallet that's on your phone, they've stolen your, your cryptocurrency. So that's an area where there's a huge potential. And then one that's becoming more interesting these days is electronic voting. To be able to vote, the government needs to know who you are. They don't need to know. They don't want to record what you voted for, but they need to be sure that you're really who you are to avoid a voter fraud. So that's a, another thing. So quite a few you know, possible applications from this pretty All right, so if we go back to that question from the beginning, how do you identify yourself? Now to access your mobile device, your laptop computer, just open them. To initiate a bank tra transaction, just go to your banking website and initiate it. Pay a merchant, just press the accept button on the mobile payment app or whatever, and you can be sure it went through and they can be sure you were a legitimate customer. All right, so these daily activities become simple, and more importantly, the transactions generated by them cannot be forged or changed later on, you know, without being obvious. So at this point, then we have a, a truly convenient fraud proof way to identify ourselves anywhere and at any time. All right, so we've reached the end of my presentation. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, I, I hope you have some questions and comments for me. I've put some up here to get us started. But, um,
break it into two pieces that neither piece contains any information about the key is to use what's called an exclusive order operation on the bits in the key. Okay, and um, this has been around for, well, people have known this for many, many years, but what the interesting thing is that if I have a key and I break it into those two pieces, let's say my key is a thousand bits long, I break it into two pieces that are each a thousand pieces long. And the way I do it, I generate a random bit string of a thousand bits. And then I do this exclusive OR operation to get the actual key. And that gives me a third key. Now all of those look random. All three of those are random. And so I store one of the generated ones on one device and one on the other and throw away the, the key. Okay? Now, because both of those are a thousand bits each, if you have a 50-50 chance of whether each bit is a one or a zero in the, in the actual key. So, probably more technical than most people care about. But that's, that's, it's very, very simple. The point is it's very easy to implement as part of our, your computer. Just about every operation it does is actually doing an exclusive board. And what happens if you use or the ring or the phone? Correct. So, if you think about it, because each of those keys has zero information about the actual notary key, you don't really care if somebody gets a hold of it. So if, let's say you lost the phone first, that's the more likely one. If it's a ring or something, you're hopefully not going to take it out well, except for charging or some interesting issues around it. How do you charge the, if there's a bad ring, how do you charge it? There are some passive technologies where you don't actually need to charge, so um, I think there's ways to get it. Back to the question. So if you lose the phone, you get a new phone. Okay. Now remember that I talked about the way we split that thing out. One of the things we do is we generate this long random. Sorry. Okay. Generate this long random um, string. That random string is generated by a one-time passphrase that you either memorize or write down and put in your state. So if you need to regenerate that, you can enter that passphrase in it, and it will give you exactly that same one type of thing. The ring still knows its half, and so they still repeat. But the cool thing about this really is that you can throw the ring away, get a new ring, generate a new notary key, and everything you've already signed, all everything you've already notarized, is still valid. Okay, because that public certificate that's in the cloud will go back. This public certificate that's in the cloud here, that's fine for anybody to see. It can always be used to validate anything that was signed earlier. And then when you have a new notary key, you'll get a new certificate in the cloud as well. And so everything that's signed knows which. Um, sorry, you're the reason I'm wrong. No, no, no. Okay. I'm just wasting my anyway. Oh, okay. Um, anyway, that's 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 how you do that. So it's the nice thing is that you can lose either one and not worry that somebody's going to. Still. If they get both, though, obviously if they held a gun in my head, I give them my ring and give them my phone, and they would have access to it. So then I could go out to the website and basically say that notary key is no longer valid. Anything signed before is fine, but no, nothing signed later is valid. Okay, Ian? So I'm Ian. I'm a local BC finance and I'm a lawyer. I have a question for you. What can I do with your patent that I can't do right now? Like, at, and, and I'm sort of talking about enabling, right? And, and yeah, answer that. So if, if I buy your patent, or if I license your patent, what can I now do? In a, like, one sentence <coughs> answer. Yeah, I was like, can I practice the product? I wanted to Can see. I build the product? Like, tell me, tell me what I'm buying, right? Yeah. So, some of it comes to the value proposition. Depends on who you are in this. If you were, let's say you were a device manufacturer. Uh, sorry, I need more specific. Let's just say I'm a device manufacturer. Can I now sell a product that does automatic login for your license? Yes. Okay, I disagree with you. Okay. And here's, I was hoping you were going to say something like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> patents are a plot of land and a roll of fence. And that's it. So licensing a patent is land speculation. There are a couple of key assumptions you have to make. One, 
that I own a piece of land that somebody's going to want to buy, right? So it doesn't have easy access to water, to, you know, so analogies here. Does it have easy access to customers? Does it have easy access to all of the inputs that a business needs? Right. And then I got to sell to somebody who wants to unroll their own fence and build a business on that plot of land. One inch over, not my land anymore, or somebody else can make me one. So patents give you exclusionary power over a very narrow piece of property. That's really hard to commercialize. For example, I raised my left hand, and the reason I did that was to show off this cool watch I got that Apple sold to me. It does 95% of everything you just talked about. And the catch is, if I don't buy your patent, I can still make this product. If I buy your patent, I can still make this product. If I buy your patent, I still can't make it any better or worse than I could without your patent. So if I'm not, or if I'm anyone else, the only value in buying your patent is if I think you're going to sue me and I'm not willing to either crush you or buy you off my patents, <laughs> which is a huge bet, Yeah. right? So I, I think my feedback in all of this question is you really got to build a product. Right? Otherwise, the value of this patent is you just need to submarine it. You need to sit back, wait for five years to go by, wait for everyone to be practicing your patent, and then you need to lawyer up and sue. Yeah. And that's the only value. You can't wait until you have to do it the first, the first person that violates it. You see the catch, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Like, I think the feedback is you got to build a product. Yeah. Patents in the abstract are exceedingly difficult to monetize. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, my company can't afford to go lawyer up against the I know. Apple, and those. so that's why we're trying to sell it. Yeah. Um, I mean, we can sit on it, but yeah. I, I know, and, and that's and that's yeah. that's the problem. So, like, the, the problem here, and that's why I said, like, the solution you got to build a product. Yeah. One more, just before I get to the next question. Um, one more thing I want to point out. So the Apple Watch actually wouldn't work as a smart device here. And the reason is it allows you to install applications. So really what you're looking for is a pure hardware, hardened, um, even passive device where you know it just needs to be close enough to... That's what your patent covers. Yeah. But as a consumer or as a business, I don't know if I care yet. You're telling me that I care. You're telling me I have a patent that lets you do that. But my question is, I don't know if I care about that. Yeah. Do I care? And I'm trying to figure out how to, to, how to convince people I should care. Because yeah. that, on your watch, your notary key, if you will, is on your watch. Mm -hmm. It is. And but again, like, our entire current system of public private keys yeah. is built on third-party certificates where everything is software accessible anyway. There's always an app on something. So having one piece of the system hardened, but yeah. leaving the other parts of the system unhardened, the entire system is still just as vulnerable as if both parts. So anyway, like, Wait, this is terrible. Okay. Okay. But yeah, and yeah, I, don't exactly. get, I don't want to get. I don't want to get in there. I just have four. But that, that's that's, <laughs> that's good. That's good feedback because now I know what part I did yeah. to convey. The <laughs> ring actually, like I said, that the notary key never leaves. Yeah. So any application, rogue application has no access to that. You know. All I'm saying is I don't think that matters to anyone. Maybe you're right. So um, okay. thanks, Andy. Because I love when he sets the stage. He does a great job. <laughs> um, I'm getting everybody thinking about it. Uh, Ken Shaz, I'm a business consultant. And uh, um, anyway, I am uh, an investor. Um, I'm working with a company right now that has four patents. Great ideas, great concepts. And we haven't got tons of advice around this. You have to prove, build it, approve it. No one will buy your license. I will just, I will just confirm that as what he said is that is a really hard thing to do. Um, the second, I have one other point. The second point is I really want real world examples. I like your drawing about the contract with the bank and everything, but I really want you to go imagine from the musical order, tell me a story uh, with each one of those maybe or something that I can understand where this fits in. Yeah. I really need to personalize it. You need to make bring me in and imagine that I'm gonna wear a ring. I'm married, I don't wear a ring, but you know, skip married, he doesn't wear a ring. Uh, but like, 
okay, now I, yeah. I wear a watch. I wear an yeah, Apple watch if someone gave me one. That's what my point is that I really need to tell you a story why I did it. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm Cindy. I'm a graphic designer presentation specialist. And this kind of addresses from a presentation. I don't think I speak from presentation. That's great. Yeah. And one of the things that we missed is that you didn't, you didn't art us to this amazing solution. We grafted, so it was kind of hidden in your slides when we were talking about when we came to us. So I think that um, also the, point, the bullet points don't work for me, but one of the things you should think about is you probably have more than one slide in your mind. And I agree with your stories on some of your graphics are kind of missing what you were talking about. They're close, but you could look back at okay. them. Um, this is very unique, but, but it's different than what you guys will offer to me. Is in this kind of setup, black, black and white looks awesome there. Black is high contrast. Here it isn't, so your stuff isn't popping as uh, much. So I think that is the case. Well, that's on the projector, what you're saying. Right. On the projector. Because, yeah, yeah, it's great to know ahead of time right. what to project. That's great. Because that gives you more power. And as a presenter, I think if you have a story, you have uh, we'll see more compassion. You work out in those things, and your energy will be higher, and that might be Okay, great. Hey, everyone, I'm going to transition to the death. Um, so, I've seen two products that you could work with uh, just to kind of help you out. ORII, ORI, is a ring wearable that does cell phone calls right now, and so is my motive. And both of those just, uh, they're on Kickstarter, which is not the greatest, but maybe somebody you can reach out to and say, hey, I've got this pattern, I'd like to use your product for this to my testing. Yeah. Um, That's my motive. And so, ORII, I said, Yeah, and that was kind of what I was going to say is you might take the Jeffrey Moore approach and just because right now you have all your rolling pins sitting out there, you really should pick one and focus and find that partner and go in. I would first look at all these different markets, figure out what all the opportunities are and take a deep dive. Okay. Yeah, so in the applications, what you're saying, you just pick one application, not all of those. Really? Yeah. I mean, I would look at them all because right now, I. I, have to, I would have to go back through all your values to figure out, because yeah, they're like five different values. You know, so maybe focus on one of those markets and, and one value and, and take a deep dive. Find that partner. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm curious, which, which one would you pick? She, I, she was talking about different slides. I would say you need to go look at the markets. You know, who's playing the market? What are the risks? Who are the measures? What are the opportunities? Yeah. One of the interesting challenges with this is that because it involves the smart device, mobile phone, and something in the cloud, if you're really talking about integrating merchants and banks, um, smart device manufacturers. And so that's that's why I was trying to think, well, who has the power to do that? Maybe Visa, MasterCard, or somebody who's already connected to a bunch of people. Yeah. yeah. Do you know somebody at Visa? I do. Oh, I would love to. Yeah. That's what I need in those types of meetings. Yeah. Yes. So I'm Rick Brennan, an entrepreneur, and uh, uh, I've been involved with highly secure DOD systems for almost 20 years. Um, and you know the concept coming about something new. Uh, I like the implementation. Um, I think you have to think about how break-ins actually happen because um, selling better encryption or selling more secure final mile um, doesn't line up with where the break-ins actually happen. And so, you know, for folks that are knowledgeable about security, there's a huge gaping hole that you could easily fill, right, that says, what if I lost my ring? Or what if somebody calls up Visa and says, I lost my ring, and they've got you know, so how do you how do you how do you issue the first ones and how do you reissue? And it turns out that's where most break-ins happen, right? It's not breaking the encryption or, or right. It, it's it's I, I call up and say I'm Jim Sears, but I'm not really. And all of a sudden now I have this thing, and I boy, everybody now really trusts me, which is what we are definitely afraid of in the weapon system stuff that I did for DoD is that. 
It's not that people are going to break the encryption. It's that somebody gets inside, and now we trust them. Yeah. And now they ramp it through the system. Yeah, so let me repeat back what I heard, because I think I understood it. The key really is you can have a unique identifier for you, but you have to prove that it's really linked to the you that you're saying you are. Right, right. Similar at the beginning. And that's a weak link in, yeah. in, in all the two-part authentication. Yeah. It's not. So we're moving all the passive biometrics for the super secure stuff, right? Yeah. Because it's really hard to fit that. Um, but there are a whole series of things that this would be a cheaper, better solution for if the other part is really bolted down. So if the issuance side is really bolted down, and now this is very secure in the final mile, and it's really easy, I would look at those markets. Um, and mass markets are going to be really tough because this doesn't solve the problem mass markets have. This really solves the highly secure, but I got to make it easier, you know, building entry you know, yeah. stuff where I've got complete control of the employee that I issue it to, for example, and I want to make it really easy for those employees to get into a highly secure part of the building. That this looks really good for that. Do you have some um, contacts in those industries that you discuss? I do. Yeah. That, let me um, go to one uh, and let me and let me just. Uh, pile on with Ian. I also did M&A from GE. <coughs> People don't buy patents. <laughs> um, they, they buy patents, but not for very much, and, and for usually defensive reasons. Um, I think if you worked through this to a proof of concept, and then partnered for corporate capital with one of these players, you, you, could, you could have something that's a, a knockout of the park. And I'm going to add one word to the end of what Rick just said, because I echo all of it. Blockchain. And I hate to be the one to say that. <laughs> I hate with a vengeance just adding blockchain to the end of shit. <laughs> but you gotta add blockchain to the end of this shit. Because, like to Rick's point, it's about like it's about the last mile, right? The and this goes to the point of like the ring, and is the ring hardened or not? Like yeah. who cares? That's not where the break gets happening. Yeah. Right. It, it just doesn't matter. It's like it's right. like saying, "Is my inner door locked?" Well, it doesn't matter. That's not what people come through your window. Right. Right. So Ian, you're saying something like the Ethereum identity um, uh, proposal, I, right? Where you're putting I don't know about Ethereum. That I, that I, well, that's see the idea. The idea here, I mean, I know about Ethereum, but like I don't know what that fits. The, the idea here is blockchain. At its core is simply a distributed letter that's ledger that's cross validated. Yeah. And so you can't really hack it, but like the idea of like really proving that you are you and the ring. Yeah. You know, I, I think that there's that's that's there's the potential. So the yeah. thing is putting on the blockchain your identity credentials. So it has your public key. So that's the thing in the cloud, and then it has your email address, your phone number, your name. And so once that's in there, you know, it yeah. still doesn't get around the problem. Well, how do I know that, you know, when you put it in there, you were really you said you put it. But once it's in there, nobody can run with it, nobody can steal it, which is really exactly powerful. So, so I guess my, my real point is that if you can pick a narrow market that has this particular problem in spades, has the other stuff bolted down, and this value proposition then really makes sense. And then you can expand after that. But I think you could get to market really quickly with uh, an implementation for the right market. And, and with, you talk about hardware implementation, right? Uh, no. <laughs> I'm that's, that's really, this is, the hardware piece is the, obviously, where the patents. No, I'm thinking about market entry. So implementation is the market that, that you're solving a problem. Yeah. But however you do it, software hardware, it doesn't matter. Right. It has to be done. It has to solve a real problem yeah. that they really, really have. It, your your presentation is just this huge umbrella here that says everybody's got this problem, and in fact, they have very narrow sections have it in an urgent way that's really a top of mind problem. That's kind of the definition of a product, right? So if you've got a great product definition here because you're really hitting the target, and, and those targets are out there for you, um, then I think you're you're off and running. Okay. Anyone else before I say something else? Robert Jordan, I've been in uh, software product for a long time, and uh, I saw this come across the color of the blockchain in the Slack channel, and it interested me because I've been talking a lot about this specific area, because there 
People are not yet ready to own their own identity. They're not ready yet to own their own uh, finances or bank accounts or anything like that. So back to your comment as far as there is this urgent kicking need in specific segments that this has a home for. So this is, to me, this is on the road to where we're going. And I, I, I think this is a stepping stone to get there. Um, and it's interesting because it's not going to be just this in your mobile device. It has to be something more. Is it, is it a combination of a retinal scan? Is there actually a chip to the screen of many you know, that's inside your body? You think of the thread if someone walks up to you with a gun and says, give me everything, and then, they, then you, your identity. Um, but there is also, if you take a look at this application, you know, there is probably best in crypt cryptocurrencies, right? Is, is one with merchants, potentially. Uh, another gentleman, there was a blockchain conference a couple weeks ago that I went to, that he was in charge of looking at uh, distributed ledger technology throughout the credit unions. And you know anything about credit unions, they're in business for their members, right? Very different than Wells Fargo, Chase, or other people. So, um, and they're actively looking for an implementation. This could fit somewhat into that. But I think that there is a real need. People do not know why they need this today, but there are certain industries that really understand why they need it. And I think that's where you focus on this, in this again, the stepping stone to get into where we truly will own our own private keys. Right. We will be our own banks. Some people might disagree with me on that. We will own our identities. I agree. We're going to pull that back when we need to. That's a great thing. Yeah, because you're, you're probably right. This is probably a little early for where most people are. But if you bring up Equifax. Yeah. I know, that's a problem. Right. Yeah, and the thing is that once they're compromised, they're compromised for the rest of your life. And half of us are in this room. So I agree with Ian here in the sense that um, the customers, the markets that I think you're identifying, my sense is that those people want to buy a product they can implement as opposed to permission. Yes. Okay. Yep. In a sense of licensing or patent, you're giving them permission. They're too busy. They want, a, you know, they're not in the business of developing and selling security products. They just want to engage the purchasing department and buy something. You know, so that's what I'm doing. I like that a lot. That's a great way of like phrasing it. The buying permission is going to get, and now like my, my comment, which was, you said two things that were kind of scary just a second ago. You got a couple different ideas on problems and markets and how it would work, but you said, that's not what this does. This is really hardware. That really terrifies me. Okay. And here's why. Back to the land and the fence, you're standing in the middle of the field. Yeah. You've got your fence in next to you, and you're yelling at people who are trailing or blazing a trail 400 yards away and saying, come over here. And they're like, fuck that, we're going this way. Yeah. Right? You need to go get over in front of them and put up a shop and say, I'm selling stuff you guys are going to need. That's what you got to do. And again, like yelling, guys, I'll give you permission to come over here on my land. Like, it doesn't help. Yeah. Right? You gotta or, or even better, if they're if, if they're walking, you need to show up with a bus. Yeah. yeah. So there you go. <laughs> so if I understand this right, what you're saying is Crater Dog technology should go out and develop the radio yeah. like one of the devices, but then stay the radio. And because it's simple, I mean it's hard, but it's simple and yeah. secure. Yeah. And then maybe write an application that uses it, but that's then at least you can show it. So, That's part of it. I mean, like, I think there's there's more to it. I think that, like, I'm not sold on the problem. Yeah. I'm not sold on the solution. But assuming those two, yes, go ahead and build a ring. But assuming those two is a big one, right? Yeah. So I would go test those two and dive into what Rick's talking about, which is lead with the problem. Though. Yeah. Who really, who really has a problem in this space? And what does it really look like? What are the meets and bounds, as a patent term, you get the joke? Um, what are the meets and bounds of the problem? And how cute is it? And does the solution that I've kind of had envisioned really solve it? Or do I need to get off my own idea and pivot around it and try to approach it in a different direction? Because like there's a lot of stuff going on here. In theory, like the umbrella here is like, yes, everyone has. It's like rain is a problem. Okay, there are a million ways to solve it. Like roofs, umbrellas, getting out of the rain, like take your pick. So I, I'm not convinced that this is the right problem with the right solution. You're in the space. So to carry off of that, 
maybe, and I don't know all the details, but uh, passionate people with a security issue with this whole uh, phone business might be parents who are worried about their kids, and thus you could have a pretty good beachhead market consisting of older right moms. <laughs> Uh, which there's adequate, perhaps, money now to launch and the need for their kids to be, you know, secure in this way. Okay. Right. I, do want, I do want my son to only buy the things that I know are really him. But beyond that, like, I don't know, that's, that's like a 10 year old. Like, that's, that's 10 years from now when he's buying shit online. Yeah. Not that. Okay. So, are there other security companies that have a similar, like, ranked phone type? Yeah, of one of the best, and it actually looks identical to what we're proposing here, is called Tokenize. So it's Token Ring, but the company is Tokenize.com. Have you talked to them? I mean, is it I've tried. The, the hard part is, how do you get any feedback? I've sent them, you know, messages, show, you know, Elevator pitch and whatnot. Do you know their patent portfolio or they No, in fact, um, they still haven't released the product yet, so it's one of those where you go, ah, it's just a link. But it's it's nice. But what they're doing is they're storing all of your information, so your passwords, your social security number, your credit card numbers, everything about you is stored on a ring encrypted. Okay, so it's encrypted using a password. So of course if you get that password, you get everything they have. But um, so I guess it was Rick's point, the biometrics part, when you put the ring on, it reads your fingerprint, and that unlocks the ring. And when you take it off, it, yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's nice. nice. That is, I but if you think about it, that's a completely different problem, right? Your, your passwords are already in other places. Your credit card numbers are certainly other places. So that's a convenience thing, but it's not protecting you from those things getting stolen. And so that, the difference here is, <laughs> Any sort of security problem comes down. The, the, the keystone for every security problem is first identity. You first have to know who is this person. How do I know you really are who you say you are? That is the key thing. Once you, once you know that, then authentication and authorization and all the other things that come with it, you know, motorization, those all build on top of that. But you have to solve that identity. I have not seen it solved anywhere yet, besides our own I would love to hear about some other solutions. Does your patent work in China? Well, remember, this is a, a US patent, and it's not a product. OK, but then, because you could just go, if you could get the Jack Ma, Alipay. Yeah, I, well, I think they probably have to go. You wouldn't get a set. I'm pretty sure they've already sold it. Patents still work in China. Right, but at least you can prove the idea. Yeah. Do you have a product? Yeah. There's, the there's an argument they don't work in the United States for small companies, too. Which I have so far. So, yeah, I have not filed any international patents on this. Yeah. Other comments or questions? Uh, Brian, I'm a software developer in Australia. Um, and nobody's concluded from the developer's perspective. Um, so if I, I were a product developer, and I, I saw a $3 million price tag, um, but essentially the value of a patent depends on um, you know, how, um, well, how broad it is. And you know, it seems that if it's fairly narrow, my first thought is to work around it. <laughs> and it seems that either you've got a narrow patent that is probably easy to work around, or if it's fairly broad, trying to claim like just separating key and two pieces like that, it seems likely there's prior art. Um, to, to me, I, I would I would think it's very likely that I could challenge this thing or the work around it. Um, um, the devil's in the details. If you don't present enough details to me as a developer to you know to know that I should take this seriously. Yeah, that's it, maybe that I should, but I, I just yeah, that's a tricky one. I mean, if you go read the patent, and it's mind-numbingly boring, but um, there, there are a lot of books, patents. I mean, I'm from the software world, I know in the hardware world, there tend to be more credible patents. In the software world, there tend to be a lot of <laughs> You can't get software, you software world. You can't get software patents anymore. Uh, they, they, yeah, yeah, but in the past, I think I'm just saying that I, yeah. I dealt with bogus software, yeah. software yeah. patents. So this is just considered considered a hardware patent. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, so it when it's still, when it still can, can it be easily worked around, or right. if broad, can it be squashed right. because of prior art? Or? Yeah, the prior art that we found at the, the patent um, 
patent officer found had to do with splitting keys. So the patent office tends to not do their job. Well, um, they had a pretty sharp young woman who knew security inside and out, so she was quite good. <coughs> the ones that they found split the key into half of it's in the cloud, half on your device, but that doesn't help you. You need both you know, with you, and there can't be any information about the key, your other key on either one of those devices. That's really the hard part of the problem. Solve. But yeah, you're right, it's possible it's uh, work around it. But remember, it is a hardware patent. It really is patenting you know, the concepts up here, less on what's on the front. <laughs> and what it seems, if our developer coming out solving this problem, it seems fairly obvious. So yeah. just because it was branded as a patent doesn't mean, but it doesn't seem how strong a patent is. Yeah. Um, and especially. If, if you can solve the problem in a, in a fairly similar way, I think that's a rapid pattern. Yeah. It's, I, it's it's awesome. the pattern I'm a software software guy too. Um, I think I have 13 security related patents, <laughs> something like that. Um, and it's very hard to make something secure in software because there's always attack vectors, right? And so that's why I was trying to point out it's important that this be hardened. You know, it's not software, it's hardware. Hardened and you know it's yeah. as simple as possible. Right? It's not a smart watch that has yeah. A bunch and, of again, and again, that concept seems seems like an obvious way to approach the problem that I would suspect other folks have done. I, I can't I mean, for sure that at least yeah. The, 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 the yeah it sounds right. sounds familiar like I've seen that type of concept. Before. I don't think the intellectual properties are there. I don't think the intellectual properties the patent the, the patent is the barrier or the problem. But I think the challenge is you've got to get a, a, a problem where somebody really, really wants to solve it yeah. and solve it for them, and then they won't give a shit about the patent. Yeah. Yeah. So my takeaways are, um, first of all, I'm probably not going to sell the patent. I could develop um, a product <laughs> and then sell the company. Um, and also, um, I need to focus more on some specific use cases for specific application areas, specific value propositions, right? And then also the design of the, of the uh, presentation could be better, especially for a um, So, So yeah, one more quick comment. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you're an inventor, not an entrepreneur, because that's how an inventor talks. An entrepreneur says, I want to build a business. Correct. You need an entrepreneur partner. You, or, or somebody that you can be the passive inventor for yes. and they run the business. Yes. So if you, if you have um, <laughs> suggestions on partners, let me know. I am I'm retired, so I do this for fun. So um, there are circumstances when you can sell a patent, and there are companies that do that in their business model. Uh, they're called trolls. Yeah, I don't want to sell it. Um, but I think that if you if you actually want to sell your patent or enforce it, then trolls are basically your best option. And maybe they're much maligned, but they're there for a reason. And maybe that they're there to facilitate people like you doing what you want to do. Um, another point is that a patent is much much more valuable after, for the reasons he mentioned, after it's been litigated. Because um, it's to the test of litigation, basically. Or, or have, after it's gone through kind of like post some kind of post grant proceedings, I don't know if you're familiar with the recent Supreme Court decision in oil states, but you know there's uh, that law is kind of in the process. Well, the Supreme Court just settled a question about about basically the patent office can take away your patent without a, a lawsuit. Um, but if you actually just want to do your patent. <laughs> Maybe you look for an opportunity for some kind of lawsuit or post grant proceeding that you that, that maybe um, is against a less uh, monolithic opponent. Um, I have one of my, one of my partners used to work for 20 years at a very large technology corporation. Every time they got a letter asking them if they wanted to license something, they would send it to their legal department with the question of how can we undermine this patent. So by sending it out, you are basically going to invite people to try and right. challenge your patent. And, and maybe, but maybe you do want that, but maybe you should be very selective about who you, who you threaten. 
or who you who you you know invite to challenge your patent. It's both. So, but think of an invitation to license. From their perspective, it's an invitation for a lawsuit. Um, so basically, think of yourself as a troll right now. That's what you are until you build your product. And so either you partner with a better troll or you become a good troll. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's all we're just All right. Well, thank you.